What is going on everybody? Welcome to another Python fundamentals that aren't the basics tutorial series. In this video, what we're going to be talking about is multiprocessing. So first let's talk real briefly about why we have to use a library to do such a thing. So you might have noticed that when you run a Python program, even if you use, say, threading, uh, your, your CPU does not get fully utilized. Depending on how many cores you have, you'll get different numbers. Personally, I have six cores in my processor, and a Python program that doesn't use uh, multiprocessing will max out at about 16% of the CPU. That's as much as it can give to Python. So that's kind of annoying. Why is that the case? The case is it's that way because of the gil. So maybe you've heard people complain about the gil. The gil is the global interpreter lock. It was initially put in place as a memory management safeguard, and maybe it wasn't the best idea. We do have better ideas nowadays, but the problem is we can't just take out the gil because there's a lot of infrastructure built with the assumption that we have that memory management safeguard, that we have that gil in place. So if we remove the gil, uh, we have a lot of other issues. So it's here to stay, but what can we do about it? Well, we can use multiprocessing. So what multiprocessing is gonna allow you to do is to utilize multiple processes. So with, if you, if you, you can think of multiprocessing just this way. So for example, you can write a Python program that does something and you can run it and it'll use a whole CPU. And by the way, when I say CPU, I mean a CPU core not your entire processor. So generally, let's say you've got six cores in your processor, you have six CPUs. Generally, it's just referred that way because like when you view top and stuff in, in Linux, it says it calls CPU. At least that's why I call it CPU. Anyway, um, so CPUs equals cores, okay? So you run one Python program, you can max out to 16%, but what happens when you open another Python program? It can be the same program. You open it again. Maybe you're, maybe it's let's let's say we're doing we're working with a spider or something like that, like a web a website crawler, uh, and you open one, it maxes out at 16%, but you can open another one, and that'll use a different core. They're not going to talk to each other, um, but they're going to use different cores, and then boom, suddenly you're up to 32% CPU, and then you open like 15 more of them, and bam, you have maxed out your CPU. Um, each of those Python programs is a Python process. So what the multiprocessing library allows you to do or makes easy for you is launching separate Python processes that don't necessarily talk to each other. They can talk to each other and they can pass information. They don't have to. But if you can think of the, the really basic example, like I said, just, just simply opening up multiple versions of a script that might be doing something like crawling random websites, uh, you can run multiples of those at the same time. They don't need to communicate with each other, but if they did, you might write a, a quick pipe or something that's going to allow them to communicate with between each other. You could do a lot of work, but at the end of the day, multiprocessing this library has done that work for you. So let's go ahead and talk about how to launch a simple process, um, and then we'll go from there. So first of all, we're going to import multiprocessing. It is a part of your standard library, so everybody has it. And then we're going to define a really simple function. This is just going to be define, um, we're going to call it spawn. And then all spawn is going to do is print spawn with a capital S. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do if name equals main. And if this was ever necessary, it's necessary in multiprocessing. Again, this just makes it so the whatever's under here will only run when it's the script itself that's being run. And so if the script is being called by something else, it won't run. So if name equals main, we're going to run something. And that something we're going to say is for i in range of however many you want. Let's just say, oh, not i, uh, five. And what we're going to say now is p for the process. It will be equal to multi multi processing dot process. So this just allows us to spawn a process. And we're going to say the target is going to be just the function. And that's going to be spawn. So that's our process. Then we're going to say p.start. That starts the process. p.join. Basically, this is waiting for the process to be complete. So now what I want to do is open up a command window 
uh, or terminal if you're in Linux, open up a command window, and what we're going to do is call this script. So you you could you can run it in idle or whatever, um, but it's not gonna we're not going to see the printout. So I'm going to run it in a shell so we can actually see it or in a, in command prompt. So I first of all need to specify the full path to Python. You probably don't. I just have multiple Python versions, so I need to be explicit. And then I'm going to say 10 period, and then it's multiprocessing tutorial.py. Good. So we'll run it. And then we see spawn, 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 spawn. OK, cool. Now, you probably won't see it in this case. But if I pull up the task manager, so let me pull that up. And wait for it. It's taking a while. Uh, when it finally comes up, go to your background processes. So you should get this. If you, if you see like this, uh, hit more details. And then you'll scroll down. And then basically it's alphabetical. So L-M-N-O-P. So around here is where we should see the Python processes. We're not seeing any right now. But if I go and rerun this, we should see it. Yeah, there's a couple of Python processes momentarily. What if we said... Okay, we really want to see these processes. Let's change uh, this to uh, 55. We'll save that, uh, pull back this, rerun it, hit enter, and we're still only seeing just two Python processes. So what's happening here is we are waiting on the processes to be complete with p.join. So if we uncomment that out, Save that again, and I'm come over here, rerun it. And I'm going to pull up the task manager too. We should see a lot more processes, right? So they all kind of ran at the same time. They're not waiting on each other anymore. So that's how you can both spawn and wait for processes, but also if you don't need to wait for them for any reason, you don't have to. But for example, um, a lot of times process like for multiprocessing, maybe maybe the way that your processes are going to communicate is via like a shared database of just information. Uh, but a lot of times you're going to use multiprocessing to kind of pass variables between each other. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon enough. But if that's the case, if you're waiting on a really important variable, you're going to use p.join because you're, so you can actually wait. But otherwise, if you're just trying to run these processes irrespective of each other, you can just p.start. Now, one last thing before we go, and that is arguments. So when you create a process, like in this case, we just ran spawn and spawn just did just printed spawn, but maybe you want to pass an argument to that process's function. So what we can do instead is, and when we say target spawn, we can say args, and we're going to say args equals, and we'll just use i for now. So we'll say i. If you only have one argument, you'll need to follow it with a comma. I actually don't know why you have to follow it with a comma in this case. If someone knows, feel free to let us know. That's an interesting, I'm not sure why. Uh, so anyways, if you know the answer, comment below. Otherwise, uh, we're passing i, and then let's go ahead and we'll just, we'll just format it into here. Format, uh, and we'll pass num here, and then we'll take in num, save that. And then we'll run it again. I'm not going to pull down the task manager, but uh, we should see the new printout. Right. So we get the spawn, you know, 0, 2. And we can even see that 0 comes first, and then 3, then 2, then 6, then finally 1 showed up, and so on. So, yeah. But if we did p.join, ah, I closed it. Shoot. Let me open that back up. Open command window here, c colon, python 35. Python 10 dot, um, there we go. So when we do p.join, we're ensuring that they're gonna, these processes are gonna happen in, in order. Don't close that, Harrison. <laughs> okay, and then we can also do like, we can pass another argument like i plus one, and then we don't need the trailing comma. Uh, and then we could say, we could expect that to be num2. We'll fill in, um, in the parameter num2 here, save that. Uh, and let's also <laughs> put it out. Uh, we won't do p.join since it's going to be faster not to wait on that. And then we can run it again. And while we're doing this, actually, I'm going to do... Uh, I'm trying to think if I want to just print spawn. I think we'll continue to print it, but I'm going to make this much larger. I'm going to do... 
let's do a hundred. Depending on your CPU, like if fifty-five was too much, it just depends on the CPU. Um, and I'm gonna run this, and we should get the output from the two numbers, and then also maybe see the CPU go to a hundred. I didn't catch it. It definitely went to forty-five. Uh, let's do. We'll do five hundred. Hopefully, it doesn't screw up the uh, recording, since I'm gonna max out probably the CPU. But uh, almost, there we go. Okay, 100% CPU. So there you have proof that we can actually utilize the entire uh, CPU. Um, I think that's all I want to cover in this introduction to multiprocessing. In the next tutorial, we're going to be talking about how you can share information between the processes or really more importantly, uh, not necessarily share information between the processes, but get information from the processes. Okay, so in this case, we're not actually getting any information back. P is equal to process, but we're not actually getting information here. And even if we were, how would we pull it from P? It wouldn't make any sense. So uh, in the next tutorial, we'll talk about how we can get the return information from a function rather than just having it do a task. Uh, so stay tuned for that. If you have questions, comments, concerns, whatever up to this point, uh, let me know. Otherwise, see you in the next tutorial.